Whoa. This video is intended as an introduction for people who are new to shooting or new to reloading. What I want to talk about this time is smokeless powder, also called nitro powder. It's a complicated subject which I'll have to break across more than one video. This first one is mostly about the historical side, but there will also be some technical info. I should start by saying that smokeless is a relative term. Nitro powder does produce some smoke, but nothing like as much as black powder. We call it nitro powder because it's based on nitrocellulose, or sometimes nitrocellulose plus nitroglycerin. The development of nitro powders was closely allied to the development of early high explosives. In essence it was all about nitration, the addition of one or more nitro groups to organic substances to produce energetic materials. In 1832 Henri Bracano stumbled across nitration by treating wood fibres with nitric acid. Six years later Théophile Jules Pelouse took things a stage further, nitrating paper and cardboard. But its true potential wasn't realised until 1846, when three other people discovered it. In 1846, Christian Friedrich Schönbein is said to have accidentally nitrated his wife's apron by using it to mop up an acid spill. Left by the fire to dry out, the apron then disappeared in a ball of orange flame. Realising its potential as a propellant, Schönbein joined forces with Rudolf Christian Butker, who had also discovered nitration that year, and they sought to further develop their ideas. Unfortunately, they acted too late and were pipped at the post by Friedrich Julius Otto. Professor Otto published a paper on nitrocellulose before Schönbein and Butker could commercialise their discovery. Again, in 1846, a fourth person, Italian chemist Ascanio Sobrero, a student of Palouse, discovered nitroglycerin. Sobrero was strongly against nitroglycerin's use as it was so unstable. In fact, he sat on his discovery for a full year. Some years later in Paris, Sobrero would meet another student of Monsieur Palouse, a young Swede called Alfred Nobel. Nobel was keen to exploit the potential of nitroglycerin and would go on to produce it commercially, calling it blasting oil. Later in his life, the French press mistakenly published Nobel's obituary, referring to him as the Merchant of Death. Appalled by this news, Nobel set up the famous Peace Prizes. From the mid-late 19th century then, propellants began transitioning away from black powder and towards concepts based on gun cotton and nitroglycerin. This is ordinary cotton wool, and this is commercial flash wool. It's a form of nitrocellulose of the kind used by stage magicians. It's cotton wool that's been treated with acid and then washed clean and neutralised. The washing stage is crucial because if any acid were to remain, the final product could decompose and self-ignite. Notice the characteristic yellow-orange flame. Nitrocellulose burns more coolly and cleanly than black powder, but produces a lot more gas and thus more pressure. Gun cotton was tried experimentally as a small arms propellant, but was found to be too fast and thus too dangerous. Burn speed is crucial to smokeless powder, and that's something we'll revisit. Because they were so much more powerful, gun cotton and nitroglycerin eventually replaced black powder as mining explosives. Alas, nitroglycerin is susceptible to shock, friction, heat and static, so very unstable. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the second half of the 19th century and early 20th were littered with serious accidents involving the production of either gun cotton or nitroglycerin. There were explosions at various locations around Europe and the US, including one in 1864 at Helenborg in Sweden which claimed several lives including Alfred Nobel's brother. Nobel then moved his operation to a remote site at Krummel near Hamburg, Germany. This plant suffered two major explosions in 1866 and 1870. In the meantime, there was a breakthrough. 
Nobel had tried many different ways to reduce the sensitivity of nitroglycerin without success. But as it turned out, the Krummel factory was built on dunes made of kieselgur or diatomaceous earth. Nobel found that absorbing nitroglycerin into kieselgur provided the answer he was looking for. The resulting little off-white sausages gave the world its first relatively stable high explosive, dynamite. This is some 8mm cine film my father took when I was a kid. A large extension was being built at his work right over the wall from where we lived. Whilst preparing the foundations, the builders had come across a massive piece of quartz porphyry known locally as Blue Elven. This is a very hard igneous rock and the only way to get rid of it was by blasting. I can remember this chap showing up with his explosives kit. One morning before heading off to school my dad got him to unroll a stick of dynamite and show us what was inside. Kind of like soft white plasticine. This was the 1970s, a time when hair was crazy and health and safety meant set a match to it and then leg it. My dad was filming this by peeking around from behind a large granite wall. The first couple of charges produced problems with flying debris so the men dragged a load of steel mesh across to try and suppress the blast. It didn't help much and I can remember finding jagged lumps of blue elven about the size of a beach ball that had been flung into our garden by these explosions. Going back to our history, in the latter part of the 19th century we start to see a flurry of activity in smokeless powders. The French were first with their poudre de paix, with the B standing for blanc, so white powder. Nitrocellulose was gelatinized in alcohol, rolled out into thin sheets, and then divided up into tiny flakes. This French invention was the world's first flake powder. This is some modern French flake powder and it's very much like powder B would have looked, not so much white as light green. Powder B transformed warfare because it meant soldiers no longer gave away their positions with huge clouds of black powder smoke. Also, longer range ammunition in smaller calibers became possible, thus a soldier could carry more ammo. A kind of arms race ensued based on smokeless propellants and new guns were developed to cope with the higher pressures. That's why several countries changed their service rifles around this time. By the time of his death in 1896, Alfred Nobel had invented blasting caps, dynamite, gelignite, and a propellant made from nitroglycerin, nitrocellulose solution and camphor called ballastite. Based on ballastite, the British proceeded to develop cordite. Cordite was a mixture of nitroglycerin, gun cotton and petroleum jelly, all dissolved in acetone. The resulting goo was then extruded into spaghetti-like sticks of cordite. Because cordite was actually a modified form of ballastite, Nobel quite reasonably sued two members of the British Explosives Committee for patent infringement. Fighting his case in the British courts, Nobel lost his initial suit and every subsequent appeal. Cordite then went on to become Britain's favourite propellant. This is some cordite, which I retrieved from a batch of heavily corroded British World War II ammunition. Even after 80 odd years, it still burns perfectly well, again with the characteristic orange flame. The British used cordite from 1889 all the way through both world wars and for some time after. A shortage of acetone during World War I meant we relied on powder imported from America for our ammunition. Likewise, in World War II, we bought a lot of American-made ammo which was also loaded with powder. 
Like black powder before it, smokeless propellant relies on rapid burning rather than detonation. Powders based only on nitrocellulose are known as single base powders. Those based on both nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin are double base powders. Triple base propellants, nitrocellulose, nitroglycerin and nitroguanidine are also used, but usually in big guns. It all comes down to burn speed, burn temperature and thus chamber pressure. A good smokeless powder produces the right amount of pressure over the right period. This is a fairly typical single base rifle powder. Rather like the cordite we saw earlier, this is extruded into a thin spaghetti, but in this instance it's then cut into short lengths at the factory. Powders of this type are called extruded powders or stick powders. Powders and bullets are weighed in grains or grams. A grain is one seven thousandth of a pound, so in this one pound can of nitro powder there are seven thousand grains. An individual piece of powder is called a kernel. Unlike pure nitrocellulose which burns very suddenly, commercial nitro powders burn at a more predictable rate. In the open it looks something like this. We get the same orange nitrocellulose flame, but it takes a moment or two to consume. However, confined inside a cartridge, this reaction takes only a split second. All of the gas you saw is directed at the base of the bullet, forcing it down the barrel of the gun. How about some double base spherical pistol powder? Remember, double base means it's based on both nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. Powders like this are called spherical because the kernels are like little tiny balls. Spherical powders are the easiest to manufacture. Not that much different, but once you get any powder confined and then ignite it, its true properties come to bear, including differences in duration of burn and pressure produced. Alright, that's it for this time. In part two we'll take a closer look at modern smokeless powders and how they're used in a reloading context. <laughs>